Okay. <laughs> Hi, Carl, how are you? <laughs> okay, thank you for coming, for coming on to have a chat and tell me all about your book and inspire everyone with your love for cooking. So I met Carl, cha -ching. <laughs> I met Carl a long time ago because Carl is a good friend of my brother and they were PE teachers. Were you PE teachers? My brother was, was a PE teacher. teacher. He was a history teacher. He was a history teacher in Bournemouth yeah. and has a different life there. So anyway, Carl, do you want to introduce yourself and say who you are? And Okay, I'm Carl. I'm a friend of Kirsty. I'm a former PE teacher, but I'm now a personal trainer and I've been a personal trainer for over 20 years. I own a business in South Woodchester with my wife called Personal Best Studio and Clinic. So we're a personal training studio and we have three chiropractors. We have uh, foot health therapists. We have sports massage therapists. We basically work across the whole body, really. And um, yeah, it's evolved and say this year's our 20th anniversary. Amazing. It is amazing, yes. But well, you were a massive inspiration. You were my <laughs> kind of PT. You know, it's, um, it's a long time ago that you set up Nelsworth, isn't it? Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah. 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 And then yeah, your 20 year anniversary, you decided to do this in lockdown, didn't you? I did because we uh, we got locked down three times, just as you did. Uh, you sort of went transition to Zoom very well. Our clientele um, a little bit older, so we train people up into their nineties. So we have a ninety-five year old who has home visits. Um, you know, although we see some youngsters, we have a few young um, aspiring golfers, but majority of our clients are in the sixty-plus bracket, um, and they didn't necessarily transition to the Zoom as well as as your clients have. So when we were told that we'd be shut for three months in January, uh, I thought, well, okay, what are we going to do with three months? You know, I'm never going to get this time again. Uh, it's our 20th anniversary. We'd lost a lot of business last year. So it's a case of now's the time to, to, to recoup and do something worthwhile. Uh, I share a newsletter with our clients once or twice a month, and we always have a uh, recipe. So we're always sharing recipes and they're recipes that I just been cooking and through lockdown two that remember I basically cooked a different recipe every day for the 30 days of lockdown two and I shared it on our Instagram so again just trying to get people thinking there were different things to cook so that was my challenge for lockdown two uh, and then lockdown three it's a case of, well right okay what can we do with this um, I have a couple of clients who've always said that if you ever want to write a cookbook please let us know because we might be able to help so the premise of this was the fact that um as well as the personal training, I write articles uh, for a, a fit, fitness sort of magazine. Um, and, and that's also based around nutrition, that magazine is. But uh, the articles I write are just about getting people to think in different ways. So in researching for this, I'd come across a, a video which is all about making the impossible possible. Now, when we're working with clients one-to-one, -one, whether it's they want to achieve a certain health goal or a weight goal, they often see that as impossible. And our job as coaches, trainers, is to try and show them that it is possible. So whether if that's a lunge, it's a baby step, and then we ultimately get to a lunge. If it's a running a marathon, well, it's getting them to do 5K, all those things. So everything is sort of monitored along that way from impossible out here to possible. And once you start working and seeing that things may become possible, then all of a sudden you start to do things, hear things, see things, encounter people, that sort of reinforce that. So your mindset starts to shift, that nothing is no longer impossible, things become possible. The further you go along that trail of possible, the more likely you're going to get to probable, which is what happened with the book. I spoke to a couple of people. They said, yes, we might be able to help. I'll put you in touch with such and such. Those people then helped me again. So before you know it, I've got several people in my corner that are making something that was deemed impossible now possible. Amazing. Um, which is, yeah, which is, we, we cover this in, in the book itself. Because again, most people, when they're confronted with like, what are you going to cook tonight? Even just cooking a meal from scratch seems impossible. <laughs> yeah, and you've had the book for two months and you yet to cook anything out of it. So again, <laughs> sorry, of course, you, you, but it is the case because it seems impossible. So taking something from there, and the only skill we need is to read. But often again, it's just that time to read and actually unravel things and going to do it you know how many people go to ikea get the the, the multi-pack furniture don't read the instructions just try and assemble it and it's the same when it comes to food how do you put these things together same when it comes to our exercise plan how do we put together so it'll actually work it's point is just going out running it's not going to work doing other things will help that so 
It's just slowing things down and doing that. So I had somebody who helped me big time, and that is um, Natasha Wilmore at Culpepper and Co Design. And they'd worked with us to do all our logos and rebranding several years ago, but she'd actually written a cookbook for Maggie's uh, Centres in Cheltenham. It's a national uh, charity, but they, they pulled together all these amazing uh, recipes from famous people in and around the Cotswolds. They put together this book. Now, she knew how to put the cookbook together. I knew her. I knew her branding. And I knew that her branding and our branding would go to work together. So if we could get the content, we got a book. She agreed to do it. Now my job was to try and get the content. I had three months. I basically emailed, wrote letters to every chef that, from recipes that I've been cooking to try and get their permission. Had knock back after knock back, put down after put down, because who am I? You know, I'm nothing in their world, so it doesn't really matter. But eventually I got the support of Matthew Fort, who is a food critic on the Great British Menu. And the weight of his comment, when I then contacted other chefs, I got something. So luckily, Tom Kerridge was a recipient. And of course, when you have Tom Kerridge on board, then other people then start to respond. So we gradually started to pick up several recipes. Now, I had a list of 60 recipes I wanted for the book. And I've had to change those recipes over and over because I just couldn't get permission. But we then started to think, OK, a lot about using local restaurateurs. So we've got lots of good um, food in and around the Five Valleys. Right, so we're in Nailsworth, I forgot, just outside Stroud. So I contacted all these people that we've done business with in various ways over the last 20 years and made it much more of a community thing. So rather than making it something that's just about chefs that no one really knows, this is about a community. And the idea as well behind the book, I forgot to mention, is that I just wanted to make things simple. So the book is split into about 18 chapters, maybe more, I remember, it could be 20. But in each chapter, there are just three recipes. And the reason behind that is, again, when you go to a buffet, if you've ever been to a wedding or you've been on those cruise liners, and you're confronted by this buffet, you've got so much choice. And no matter how much you pile your plate, you're going to walk away from that buffet thinking, you know, I left something out there. I'm dissatisfied. Too much choice is just too bad for us. And that's what's happening in our life at the moment. I feel that there's too much. We just don't know what to choose. You ever looked at Netflix in the evening, think, what am I going to watch? And you choose something, you're never really fully happy. So if you've just got three things to choose from, chances are the choice you make, you're going to be happier with because you only left two things out there. So in each chapter, starting with snacks, we work our way through with very simple recipes. So the simplest recipe is a kale crisp. Get some kale, wash it, cut it up, cover a little bit of sesame oil, some sesame seeds, put it in the oven. Five minutes later, you've got a kale crisp. Again, children can do that. Anyone can do that. And they're delicious and really healthy. So it works its way through. And some of the recipes, well, most of the recipes aren't actually healthy. You know, there's lots of things like treacle cured beef, which is very expensive, but again, it's something for Christmas Day, maybe. But we have desserts, we have cakes, but it just breaks down into three things you choose from. So that's the idea behind the recipes in the book. But interspersed between the book are also stories about the refuse, because what we forgot to mention is that this book isn't about me, it isn't about the recipes. This book is about raising the profile for a charity that's sort of dear to our hearts, and that's Stroud Women's Refuge. So we've done several things over the last couple of years to raise money for them. So in lockdown one, all our Zoom classes raised money for them. Before lockdowns ever happened, we did a pre-love close sale and raised several thousand. Before that, we'd collected toys, we collected toiletries, clothing, etc., for the refuge. Because what struck a chord with us when we found out about the refuge, and again, not many people know that there is a refuge in Stroud, and if they do, they don't realise that it doesn't get a lot of funding, it's all self-funding, is it isn't just women in there, there's lots of children. So when we discovered that, there's lots of children there, having children ourselves, you just thought, Blackie, some poor child has been whisked away from a home in Norwich overnight, been brought up here in a police van with his family, doesn't know anybody, has a small bag, nothing else with them, what they must feel terrified, petrified, plus all the circumstances they've experienced up to that point. So it's a case of we're trying to do things to make it better for them in our small way, it's a charity that doesn't really shout out much. And again, it's not one of those charities you're going to shout out about because it's hard subject to broach. But we thought if we did something that's like colourful and has branding like this and has a message that's in here that sells it, then that would work. 
So between all the pages, between all the chapters, there are actually stories from the refuge, from women who've been to the refuge and have had some experience there and benefited from the, what the refuge has to offer. And the, the feedback we've had so far, you know, lots of people said it's the only cookbook they've ever bought that they've actually cried reading the cookbook because it's, it's sad stories. But again, you wouldn't buy a book on sad stories about women in refuge and think I'll donate to it, but you'll buy a cookery book. And most people buy cookery books at Christmas and they never look at them. <laughs> but again, if you just buy this cookery book and never look at it, your 20 pound has actually helped somebody. It's, it's lovely and it's, you've got inspirational sayings in it as well and it's just lovely photos and yeah it's yeah. more than a cookbook it's, it's a it's like a mindfulness mealy meal journey yeah so uh, journey yeah so we, we so we put in uh between the chapters again from the refuge because we didn't all to be heavy is actually things to help the reader make changes so the things we're talking about seeing the impossible making it possible um Having that notion is that you only see what you see and you only hear what you hear. And if we relate that to food is the fact that when we go to the supermarket, we'll tend to always park in the same bay, pretty much. And we'll always follow the same route. And chances are we'll always see what we always see when it comes to the shopping. And we'll always put that same thing in. And then, hey, presto, we'll always cook the seven sort of five or six meals over a 10 day rotor and we might have the odd meal out but if we do we tend to eat the same thing and we go the meal out because we go to the same place so we're very much creatures of habit so in our world when we're trying to get people to change those habits it's very difficult to make them to make big changes in those habits if they can't make small changes in their daily habits so where our gym is you've seen it we have a lovely converted uh, water mill big car park in front of us and i see my clients come in and i see my clients park in the same bay each time, just preach of habit. And I've got clients been coming for 20 years and they'll park there. And I often question them, say, oh, you know, try and park in different bays. And if they can start to do that, because they do have to really think about it. And that's the thing is we don't think. We're on autopilot all the time, which is what you are when you go to the supermarket, which is what you are when you open your cupboards. What can I cook? I'll cook what I know what I can cook. We tend not to go out of autopilot. And that's what we're trying to do. So some of the words in the book just help people switch off autopilot and think. It's a bit the same with moving, isn't it? We get an autopilot of when you get out of the way of moving, it stops. So even yeah. just by talking to you, I'm going to think, right, I'm going to do one or two recipes. So when I, I do the reset programs and through that, it's getting people to be, you know, feel fitter, healthier, and, you know, and it, quite often it's about um, planning meals. Yeah. Um, so, and I always say, don't, it's a lot of people start and they try and plan five new meals. And I'm like, no, go for your yeah. favorite ones of habit. <laughs> yeah. That's not like yeah. a bit of habit. And then one or two meals a week. And, um, and I think that is enough for people, like when they're coming to me in the reset, one or two new meals a week. And what I really try and encourage is batch cooking. So if you're yeah. cooking a meal and you've got some leftover, pop it in the freezer. And so, yeah. um, it was um, Dizzle Sky Kitchen Coach, Annabelle, she was saying to me, the freezer is your friend, not your graveyard. And I thought that yeah. was really helpful. True. It's so true, isn't it? And, it is. and this, I mean, I, I, the parsnip soup is what I'm really cool, really keen to have a go at. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, and, and we had a conversation before about food shopping as well, didn't we? And that you were saying mm. about shop at home before you go food shopping. Yeah. So, um, what tips would you give to that busy person when they are planning their food? Well, I often um, plan, as it were, almost two meals in advance. So in the book as well, we have a section based on leftovers. So unbelievably, I don't have a freezer. I have a freezer box that's so big and it has ice cubes in. I think there's one ice cream, some oven chips because we've got kids, yeah. and some frozen peas, which come in handy as ice packs. But I don't really freeze things. Um, but... Tonight, I'm going to be cooking a rice dish, but I will cook extra rice because I want to use the leftover rice tomorrow in another rice dish. So tomorrow night is going to be egg fried rice, whereas tonight the rice goes with a curry that I made the day Where? before. So the idea with the curry the day before, I had time to cook yesterday, but I won't have time to cook today. But I can cook rice because that doesn't take so long. But the curry I cooked, better, uh, cooked yesterday is going to taste better today because it allows to melt. And often or not, the food that we eat when we're out there's far more things that have gone on with that food it's not fresh it's the preparation that happens so the preparation 
yesterday making that because I had the time means I'm going to get double the benefit today because that food has now really got those flavors. So I'm really going to enjoy that. The rice I'm cooking tonight, I'll enjoy with it. The leftover rice tomorrow is fine. And I've got a few vegetables left from yesterday's curry, which I'll put in there with my stir fried egg rice. So in theory, I've cut down my food costs, but I've also cut down my preparation time. And time is really the essence because we'll happily pay. We'll pay to have bags of things that have already been prepared. But what we haven't got is the time to do that. So if we can save time somewhere down the line, it makes a big difference. And it's making that time to plan, isn't it? I'm always, yeah. I'm always going. So with the reset, so always plan your food, plan your food. And actually, some people and um, plan it in a scribbly bit of paper. Some people plan it in their heads. Yeah. You know, some people have a format. Some people have a two-week rotor, like you were saying. Yeah. And then I love the idea of using your leftovers and to actually make it easy and save money because. Quite often when people are busy, they go to the supermarket and they go and they spend a lot of money on their food shop. And actually, you could half that, couldn't you? Yeah. And then they spend a lot of money on waste. And then you might be encouraging, we just like we might be encouraging, you know what, it's really good if you had a massage once a month, or oh, I can't afford that. And yet reality is they have, but they choose chose to use it on wasted food or food that's not of value. And they say, I like going out to restaurants. Um, but I want value. And that's not that I want a value meal. The restaurant experience now has got to be the added value that I can't get from that meal, which is good service, good ambiance, nice surroundings, good food I can get at home, but I can't get good service. I don't necessarily get good ambience. So that's where we have to get the added value. Um, and I think, you know, it is just that case. And it, it, it's, um, it's a bit stereotyped and it's almost that sexist, but it used to be that case that the housewife the house person, someone took responsibility for the home. And over the last 40 years, quite rightly, there's been a massive shift in that the home isn't necessarily taken care of, but we've bought in so many labor-saving devices that should in theory save us time, but actually it just creates more stress, more hassle, and actually we don't have much more time, and the time we do have, we choose to spend on other things. But someone would plan meals for the week because they couldn't afford to have meat every day of the week, so they'd buy a bigger joint of meat at the weekend. And again, that's better value for money because you get more flavor. It doesn't dry out. Plus you get all the offcuts for the rest of the week. So they plan that. You can make stocks from that. So a chicken, if you cook a chicken, you always make a stock from that. And that's just basically putting your chicken bones into a saucepan with some leftover vegetables, some water, simmering up for an hour and a half. You've got a vegetable stock there now, or chicken stock, sorry. That basically with a bit of coconut milk, some chili, lime, ginger and coriander is a Thai curry. You know, there's enough chicken left on that. So there you go. That's an easy meal, isn't it? That's cheap. But it's just thinking ahead, thinking that chicken doesn't go to waste. So spend a little bit extra on a better quality chicken. So you get all the flavor, plus you get all that goodness from the bones. And then you're going to get your Thai soup or Thai curry the next day. But it's thinking ahead. So what would you, how do you plan your food for the week? Because you're obviously really good at, at maximising the use of the food. Okay, well then I don't, I shop every day. Yeah. So I, I shop every day, um, but sometimes I'm thinking two days ahead, not, yeah. not for the whole week. So um, I'd like to say I'm like those, the TV chefs always try and say, yeah, I walk around the market and I see what's fresh and I squeeze this and I squeeze that. That's nonsense. You can't do that. I race like you do between clients before picking up the boys up from school. I'm in the supermarket, but I try and have variety. So it isn't always the easy meal. So, but it, so the easy meal, but I will use vegetables more one day, fish another day, maybe some meat. But I try not to just go the easy option, which is just oh, pass to this, pass to that, pass with the sauce because it's easy to do that. I've been there, I'm sure you've done that, where pasta could be the staple for three or four nights of the week. And yet what you're trying to get most of your clients to do is move away from that. Mm -hmm. So um, I have green lentils, so as an alternative. So always have tins of chickpeas in, because chickpeas are really good. Green lentils are really, really good. Couscous yeah. is really good. Great chickpea one in here, actually. Yeah. And they only really need a little bit of boiled, boiled water to go on it and add a little bit of flavor herbs you know so that my supermarket shop tends to be based around herbs and then to me to, to fill up those things there yeah so um yeah i mean um when a lot of time when people come to me it's a lot about weight loss and wanting to be fitter healthy and stronger and eat well and quite often it's about looking forward to the food so part of, like you say people are eating on the go they're eating mindlessly they're not eating mindfully 
Yep. So actually, when people start to put more of an effort into the food, the meals that they're cooking, they're more excited to go for the meal. And then there's less snacking in the evening because they're feeling fulfilled because yeah. they have mindfully had their dinner. And because it's that snacking in the evening quite often, isn't it? When it's that yeah. um, weight gain. So that's the thing. I mean, I feel quite inspired at the moment. And I'm thinking I'm going to, I am going to make a real effort. <laughs> <laughs> and but, do some new meals because I'm that person with the supermarket shop. <laughs> but it, it's a, uh, it is one of those things. It, it, it's a case of actually cooking isn't a chore. But again, we see it as a chore. It's something I have to do. And I overhear so many people, especially with children, it's a case of that will fill them up. And we, our relationship with food isn't great because it is that case. We see it as filling us up. Whereas actually that whole thing about nutrition, it's actually about nurturing us. It's actually giving us nutrition. But actually, it's actually feeding us and it's feeding the soul so we're it's often feeding emotionally i talk about emotional eating all the time yeah but we tend not to be um the emotion emotionally eat for the wrong way but we could you know we love the whole spanish french italian way about they're passionate they are about food you know and food is the center of their day you know but people sit around the table and eat but the, the amount of time that they spend investing in that food so it is that market shop it is knowing where the ingredient comes from but it's actually the love that goes into the food when they're making it whereas we tend to do it in a rush quickly have that like i've got to watch this now or eat this while you're watching tv and i think if you it is a case i could give three people the same ingredients i could give them the same recipe but chances are not all three dishes would taste the same because it's about what you put into it and it's that love that little bit extra time stirring that little bit extra time simmering all those things make the difference so when you do that and you invest in your food you've already start to absorb it in many ways you're you've bought into it you're, you're the love is there so actually when it comes to eating it you probably won't need to eat as much because your eyes ears nose everything has taken on that as a sense so you'll actually enjoy it so savor it and again that case and i'm sure you advise your clients the same sit down eat your food, have a forkful, put the fork down, try and chew nice and slowly, savour the food. But because we're always in a rush, we don't savour it. So we fill ourselves before you know it, because we've not registered that actually we're satiated, we're then hungry again. But when you slow down and eat, and you've actually slowed down to cook, and you've made your meal preparation, and I tend to cook pretty much on my own, close the kitchen door, radio two's on, Joe Wiley, I'm listening to good music, and I'm not disturbed, and I might take myself like 40 minutes. That's my 40 minutes of me time, okay? And I do the food, and that's it, and then we're ready to go. But most people tend to be rushing around doing other things, not investing in that. Yeah, in a lot of people have got, you know, you're running so in the door after work, the children have to go somewhere, or you've got more work to do, or whatever. So people don't always have that time. But maybe it's prioritising that time a couple of times a week even, so you're going to yeah. have a lot of people and um, find that emotionally eating and then emotionally eating, you, there's not that stopping, there's just not a stop button as such, is there? So a new way that I'm just thinking in my head that I can talk to clients about actually put that those emotions into your cooking. So you're planning yeah. that lovely meal. Yeah. Um, you know, it could be a soup even, it could be a meal and, you know, and just enjoy it. And, and I think with lockdown, a lot of people were working from home and that affected people in so many ways. And there was so much mindless eating because people weren't stopping. They, were, they kept going. They'd have their meal on the go when they're at the computer yeah. and there was no stop. And it's trying to bring back that. I mean, we have much more time in our home than we used to. And it's trying, yeah. trying to think, bring that back. But a big topic that is, is about um, weight management. And mm -hmm. some people need weight gain, some are weight maintenance, some are weight loss. But with cooking, um, what I've, I find a lot is that um, my clients are mainly female. There are some males as well, but mainly female. And they eat with their family. And quite often the male cooks, actually, quite often. And they yeah. eat everything in. And so um, if someone's sort of struggling with weight control, what would you suggest? How could you, how can that be helped through the cooking situation? Okay, so, I mean, there's lots of, things to cover there and it can be contentious but I've had clients of the same we trained with our gym for a long time not really made any difference in weight gain but even if training two or three times a week in you know, circuit training plus one-to-one -one personal training not made a difference but then they they had to realize actually you know what I'm living with a husband who's twice my size and I've got three teenage sons who are about my size and yet I sit down and eat the same yeah it's a case we don't think that so we're all up but actually we don't take any consideration actually 
what our height is, what our weight should be. So it's portion control really makes a difference. Um, you know, obviously what you eat makes a bit of a difference, but portion control, I think, is your is your starting point. Uh, I think I'm forever being criticized because I walk around with this all the time and people buy me other water bottles, but I always go with this. Uh, I don't buy the bottle every week. I buy one bottle and I keep replacing the water that's in it. But the reason I have this is that I know exactly how much water I've had in a day. So I'm now my second fill. So I think when you feel hungry, Yes. Quarter, because often are not you're hung, you're not hungry, you're thirsty. So excuse me. Yeah, that's and that's what I was suggesting. We said two liters of water at least a day. And at some least. people are like the hardest thing, Kirsty, is drinking the water. How can drinking water be so hard? And quite often they've got a. I say, well, find a nice drinking vessel, Car, You've got a nice plastic bottle. Um, yeah. But some of my girls do that as well. They walk around with the bottle, so you know exactly how much they've had. And um, the drinks bottle, some people measure it out in a jug, so they know yeah. how much is yeah. in that drinking bo drinks bottle. So you know how much they've had. Yeah. Makes a massive difference. I mean, there, there, there's lots of people that say that you know, water isn't the be all and end all, but I just find that it's. If you're having that all the time, it makes such a difference. And I say, I almost like panicky. It's not within arm's length away. You know, but I'll just keep sipping. It's not that gulping. And so many people say, well, I can't drink water time because they go to the loo. Well, good, because that's what, that's what we do. do. You know? So again, it's understanding actually what actually goes on. And this is the thing. I just had a very expensive uh, experience with my car because so many things going on in my head the last couple of weeks. Lots of things organized. I've just cooked a supper, by the way, for 34 people. Oh, yeah. So all these things, so I'm shopping lists and all this, all that. And again, one thing is like shopping list on paper, not in your head. That makes a big difference. Take as much out of your head as you can. That helps. So even your thoughts write down, everything gets out of your head. That will help big time. But not concentrating, put uh, unleaded fuel in my diesel van. And uh, it's cost me £600 to fix. Why was I telling you this? See, <laughs> lose it, I'll come back. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just we're, we're constantly, constantly on the go, on the go. Constantly, constantly thinking and then say that is not good for us and I think you know slowing down having a sip of water you know managing your stress levels I make it a point of me because again like you you're working with people all day every day that can become quite tiring it's a lot of stuff coming to you you need that little bit of space you don't necessarily get that with your family because that's just more stuff so I will take my time out just five minutes a day and I will go and have a coffee and I'll have espresso and milk, just sit there. And that's my, as it was designed for, a little moment. I might converse with somebody, but I'm happy to have time on my own. But again, we tend not to think that we're allowed to do that. And it's a case we're going to talk about in the book is this line between selfish and selfless. Now, females judging tend to be more selfless. They're the mothers, they're the givers. They do everything for everybody else. Husbands might be seen as being a little bit more selfish. It's more of a male thing. But what we've actually got to try and do is just find that bit in the middle where we're self. So it doesn't hurt to be selfish. Take that time out for yourself. Invest in yourself. And using those, that terminology, make investments. You know, don't think, see things as your. Making investments in yourself brings you back to self. Yeah, sure, we have to do things for others because that's a good thing to do. But make sure we're always doing something for ourselves. And having water taking some time out with friends, writing your shopping list down, getting as much stuff out of your head as possible makes a difference. When you talked about, say, helping clients with weight loss, a lot of people will come in and they say, oh, I want to lose weight. And I sort of turn it around a little bit. I don't say that necessarily to them, but to actually say what you actually really want to do is you want to be happy. You're not happy with the weight you are. Now, if I said that, that's a bit of a confront, but it's a case of we're not really happy. So I often say, like, forget about the scales, which I'm sure you do. You know, find a picture of you when you were happy with your weight. Oh, that's nice. We've got that somewhere. And again, just have that wherever in your house. It reminds you daily. So that's your goal. And in case then they'll realize actually your weight is one thing, but happiness is another. And often I'm trying to think, well, what were you doing at that point? And it might be, well, I played tennis with my friends. Okay, well, why have you given up tennis? So you try and find those things because as we go through life, we give up things. And we often give up things without any real reason. And it's only 20 years down the line. You know what? I used to really enjoy doing ballet. Why aren't I doing that anymore? Well, I gave it up then because I had children, but I never thought about going back to it. But you can go back to these things. And actually, when you start to do things that you did in the past, you enjoyed, all of a sudden, you reignite other emotions, which is good. But rather than focusing on yourself, almost like take yourself out of the equation and think of you as a project. 
So if your project, your task, your human to work on for the next three months is this project, try and find as many ways you can of helping yourself lose weight, be happy. Look at that. And in the book, we talk about this concept of will it make the boat go faster, uh, which is based on um, the England rowing eights rowing team, which are always the also runs. Those that never made it for the twos or the fours, they were put into the eights. And they always went to the Olympics, but never won any medals. And one year they decided, you know what, we're going to do something and we're going to win a medal. And the only rule that they lived by was, will it make the boat go faster? So if they wanted to change the way they trained, the question was, will it make the boat go faster? The answer was yes, they do it. At the end of the training session, we're going to go for a curry as a team. Do you want to go for a curry? Will it make the boat go faster? If they thought, yes, it would, they did. And again, you sort that, ask that question yourself, will it help me reach my goal? then you can say yes or no. And if it's a yes, well, then do it. If it's a no, then don't. Rather than just beating yourself up with all these things, I've got to lose weight, I've got to lose weight, I've got to lose weight. And you're always putting barriers in the place to do that. So almost take yourself out of it. Think of it as a project and just ask that question. Will it help me? Yes or no? If it's a yes, do it. If it's a no, don't. I love that. So I, um, I often, when people come to me and they say, oh, I want to lose, and I always try and turn it around in the head, to get them to have a, a fitness goal or a health goal or something that makes them happy because I said I can help you with that because weight is just everywhere but I do have some clients who are, are say who you know the weight number is important and I respect that but yeah. also it's about being fitter healthy and stronger so I've got one lovely example that I'm, I'm going to share so a lady that started beginning in November working on a computer all day really busy um with her job with her family no time for her and she had about two two to three thousand steps a day so she's now fast forward it's only three weeks eight between eight thousand and fourteen thousand a day she wears a fitbit oh, now cool. and it links to i've got an app so it links in there so we've got a nice graph and then um she's feeling great she's just feeling so empowered she's feeling so much better through exercise and she'd be happy to say and then today um i've got a treadmill in the gym and she, she didn't really like the bike and she said I said, do you want to go to the treadmill? She went, yeah, yeah, yeah. She went, oh, no. oh my goodness, she had the biggest smile. And I didn't know how much she used to run. And she's running on this treadmill going, yes, I'm running. I'm running. I'm like, it's fine, yeah. just got to try it. And after she just had the biggest smile, and she just said, I feel wonderful. I said, I've just run. And she remembered how she felt when she yeah. ran. So exactly like you said, Carl, like what made her happy. And yeah. it is wonderful when you can facilitate that. And, and it's the power of exercise to, you know, empower yourself and the power of your food, the power of your well-being is, it's, it's just amazing. And that's, we are so lucky to do what we do, aren't we? Yeah, definitely. And I, I think there's also the caveat to that is, as well as exploring the past, sometimes we actually have to let go of the past. You know, often I see this with males, particularly, they'll come to train and I've got guys who turn up in their rugby kit they wore like 15 years ago and they expect to do the rugby workout they did 15 years ago. And is that case we've got to move on because, again, a lot of us are stuck in the past. So as well as it's good to, to revisit and find things we enjoyed, it's also a case of now trying to explore new things. So and another thing we've got in the book there so is, um, is lots of art from local artists. And the reason we've got art in is, you know, Five Valleys is surrounded by amazing artists. But often art is just then another good way of getting you to explore that creative side. And it's the creative side, I think, that often just like is the thing we overlook. It's a good way of dealing with emotions. So when I said about writing down, we've recommended so many people in so many ways. There's an amazing book called The Artist Way. And if you don't do The Artist Way, it's just a case of every morning, you just write down three sides of A4 paper. Whatever's in your head, you write it down, non-judgmental. The idea is you just start to clear your head because there is so much crap in our head. Yeah. It's a case of getting it out there. And what you'll find is that there are patterns of behavior, patterns of scripts. And it's the same thoughts. And then once you start to identify those thoughts, you can actually then start to be actually, well, what is the real reason behind that? But just exploring that artist within you or just being creative, because we never are. We never really do anything creative. But when you do things creatively, like putting your Christmas decorations up, all of a sudden you That's feel... I'm it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you start with basically a blank page and then you fill it. And that can be words, it can be painting, it can be whatever, or just like decorating Christmas tree. And that's something we often overlook. And that also comes into our food. You know, it's a case of, well, how can I make this food look presentable on the plates? So when my boys were very, very young, you used to make little shapes so they would eat their vegetables. Now it's just a case you just make sure they eat. <laughs> 
you go through those phases of actually just making things look because again we eat with our eyes so you know take that extra time to make things look good because they'll chances are they'll taste even better but also if you've written and explored that creative side elsewhere you'll be happier and maybe those goals that you were setting weren't, you, weren't the goals you really wanted to get it's another goal that you're you're reaching for so you're very similar we're very similar in the way we do this <laughs> because i was chatting to someone today so when i do the resets i mean i've set out um sent three different videos to my resets this week they're just short one's about your non-negotiables what you need to do one was about weight loss but actually talking about your inner motivation and your why and the other one was about um, goal setting but it makes you because someone will come and say right I want to lose so much or I want to be able to run 10k and I just go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into it and the way I can get people more is to do these videos which I never did before COVID yeah and to send them and then you know my social media is all linked to that as well but um yeah it's it's all there and, and I feel really inspired but by this, but I remember talking to you in lockdown and you used the word inspired. And as long as I've known Carl, he's been an amazing cook. And when I was, <laughs> was I a student, I think, when I first met you and so, yeah. you'd cook, you'd cook some, I wasn't a student, I was beginning as a teacher. That was it. And come okay. over, you'd cook steak or something amazing that I would never eat. That <laughs> <laughs> would eat, but I wouldn't cook myself. But yeah, you wouldn't cook, no. Yeah, it was just brilliant. So I'm going to buy a couple of books or get a couple of boxes at mine. So if Fantastic. anyone's watching this who comes to me, so how much they each? 20? They're 20 pounds. And say so all, all proceeds go to, or all profits go to Stroud Women's Refuge. Lovely. And, um, but they can be ordered from you as well, can't they? They can be ordered uh, online, which is uh, inspiredcookbook.co.uk. Oh, easy. I'll put I'll put the link to go with this as well. Thank you very much. So, um, um, so I've got one last question for you. Oh yeah. It's on about balance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So how how do you keep the balance in your life for your physical, mental, nutritional well being? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sometimes you know you don't, and you accept that sometimes you're not because it's. You, you're, you're never going to be perfect again and that's the thing is you, you never will be there are always going to be imperfections and i forgot to say like some of the things i'm re really working on clients is actually trying to get them to do less so when it comes to stretching like don't force themselves when it comes to exercise slow it down so again sometimes again as we're aging you know i'm, I'm mid 50s now you can't do what you did several years ago so it's just that, that understanding but it's making sure that you do have your me time so for me that's golf. I take time out, but sometimes I play golf and it might be for the score. Sometimes I play golf and it might be for the social. Sometimes I play golf and it's just to clear my head. Sometimes I play golf and it's just because I'm in the outside. And it's the same when I run. So sometimes it's about what time I've done. Sometimes it's about clearing my head. Sometimes it's about, you know, just being outside. And I think that's the thing I would take away when it comes to exercise because it's just so easy. We see it all the time. People just go through the process of just doing exercise. I've done that. What's next? But when you think about the exercise, do things slowly. You can focus on your breathing. Have an intent to what you do. So if it's a run, what's my intent today? Am I just going to enjoy the run? I'm going to work on my pacing. I'm going to work on my breathing. Have something to focus on rather than just going for a run, because it isn't just a run. There are many things for that. And sometimes what was a healthy thing physically is actually going to be a healthy thing mentally so tune into which emotion you want to use for your routine sometimes on my bike rides it's because i want to try and go further on strava or whatever or it's a case of i'm just going to take in this view because i've never been there before so making things a bit more in terms of a quest because it's never ending so so you're always channeling yourself so this month i might put into my diet um I use Dr. Short superfoods. So going into Christmas, I'll put that in. So every day this month, I'll set that. But come January, I'll do something different. So it's just all the time changing things, playing a game with your body, as it were, playing a game with your brain. So you're always just keeping things fresh because otherwise you'll become like the grooves in a record. It's the same thing you'll do year in, year out. So that's, that's essentially the meaning of infinite balance. Thanks. So <laughs> infinite balance is the never ending balance in your life, but sometimes it's more for your physical, sometimes it's less for your emotional, sometimes you don't really have any time for anything because you're so busy. Yeah. And um, but you there is always a never ending need to have some 
kind of physical, emotional, nutritional awareness of your well-being. So you always need to have something, even though it's quite small, and sometimes it's more. So yeah. that you are, and um, and I was starting to smile because I was just chatting to a lady this morning, just before this, I was on a run. And um, and I we were talking about how you can go for a run and you can listen to pop and think you're in a, a nightclub. And <laughs> yeah. in other times you're listening to very chilled music. We listen to a podcast, you want to educate and and it is, and I love, love, love the word intent because I talk about movement with intent. So we talk about a daily mm -hmm. movement, trying to have so many steps or so much movement. Yeah. But I also talk about your daily movement with intent. So you are going for a walk on purpose because we can sometimes walk around and get a 10,000 steps, whatever, but actually some of those steps aren't with intent. Yeah. So you've just um, gone a little bit deeper into my intent. So I like that. <laughs> well, you know, if, if you're being honest again, a bit disappointing, being honest, like, at the moment in my life, it's probably the most stressful time in my life ever. You know, so I've got two teenage boys, and like from this meeting, I'm going to the supermarket, picking them up, dropping them off home, feeding them, going back to work to see clients. My wife will come home somewhere in between that and say, We're really, really up against it. But it's a case of sometimes life is like that, but you know, there are ebbs and flows. And I, I think, you know, throwing COVID into this, where we're all feeling at the moment, and we feel this with clients, is that where we knew where safe harbor was. We're now just all a little bit adrift there in the ocean and we can't quite see harbour. So I think what we need to do as groups of boats is actually just sometimes nestle together, get close together, almost like forms a little pontoon. So surround yourself with people that support you because that harbour that we knew, what we thought was normal, has now gone because we don't know what normal is anymore. That's been a bit philosophical. But just get yourself a little pontoon of people, make that group that's your safety. So I think, you know, look at friendships. Do your friendships support you? Do those friendships actually just drain from you? And I think, you know, surround yourself with positive people. That makes the biggest difference. And that's the message I'm trying to give to my boys. They're now just going to the world of teenage and they believe in this one group of friends. But reality is there's 12 other groups they could deal with. Try and get a perspective. But as adults, we sometimes lose that perspective as well. We need that reminder. No one reminds us. Then what, tutor? Then what, a head of year? Then what, a head of faculty that helps them? You're just on your own as adults. So seek advice from yourself but seek advice from friends and you know and just form together stronger groups make yeah. you feel safe and stable lovely oh <laughs> thanks carl thank you for your time i know you're really busy and oh you should be so proud of yourself it's just a, a so accumulation of of everything of your past 20 years this is your journey isn't it and you're raising all that money for strides for women's refuge as well so when i cook something i'll post it to my social media <laughs> And you'll look at it and you'll be like, hey, that's not what it should be. <laughs> but so what, what's, what's your, what's your go-to meal? Not yeah, um, so my, my clients would say lentil and tomato soup. Um, okay. Tuna with anything. Chicken in any form. Um, uh, yeah, but I love food. I love, oh no, I love um, beans, lentils. I okay. love veggies. I'm always getting people to have more veggies. I find a lot of time people come and see me because they're just having a pot of pasta every night. So we're a carb, okay. carb generation, aren't we? Yeah, so definitely. I like to get people to increase protein, increase fiber. I love eggs in any way. Simon made the most amazing omelet yesterday. And um, we didn't have any food in the house, but we did for an omelet. Yeah. Um, so it's always a good so my, my top tip is just a case of always have a bag of spinach. So yeah. bag of spinach. You can chuck that into your pasta. You can chuck that into your omelette. So in the, in the book there, which I highly recommend you cook either tonight or tomorrow, is the chicken with couscous. Yeah. So basically chicken breast that you marinate in. I use Patax curry paste. That's a cheat. That's a cheat, okay? You just do that, cover it with some couscous. But underneath all that, you just put a bag of spinach, which yeah. you obviously wilted somehow. And then you, so you've definitely got your greens, you've got your protein, and you've got your grains on top. And it takes 25 minutes to cook and the whole okay. thing. Yeah. That sounds yeah. great. And I've had a whole heap of veggies. <laughs> in my family. It was <laughs> I just always have loads of veggies. But I, I think with their jobs, they're so active and sometimes yeah. they're active days, more days are active and some less. So <laughs> thank you. Thank um, you very much. I'm gonna go and have a look at this now. And, <laughs> um, it was the um there was uh, the chickpeas. Yeah. That I was going to do chickpea here is chickpeas and feta. So chickpeas yep. was a big chat um, with my groups because there was a shortage of chickpeas, wasn't there? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's not now. So. Um, but, 
But yeah. you, you can use the uh, juice from the chickpea, I don't know if you know this. Oh yeah, I've got some vegan clients. So talk okay, so you take the chickpea juice and you whisk it up and it makes like an egg white? Yes, they're telling me to do that too. So, yeah. I mean, I'd love, <laughs> I'd love to do more vegetarian, more vegan dishes as well. Um, spicy coconut fish, that's the one that I keep coming back to. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Good luck with all okay, the Take care. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.